Aloha and welcome to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30, broadcasting from the downtown studios of Think Tech Hawaii in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, we are experiencing some interesting weather these days, so it's good to be inside. Um, for those on the mainland, we've got severe thunderstorm warnings, so it's uh, good to be here doing the show this time. Uh, we just had a very interesting lunch. Normally, my shows uh, start off with a lunch to get warmed up a little bit, and we, we talk uh, about the topics. Uh, today, we really kind of got stuck on one topic, which is a, an emotional one for a lot of people, uh, controversial for, for others, uh, but we talked about immigration. Uh, and today's show is going to be a, a smoggish board of topics. Uh, it's a quarterly type show that uh, Steve Pengree and I do. Uh, and we just talk about different topics that are current and relevant in the news. Uh, Steve, it's great to have you back. It's Thank good. you, Reg. It's always a pleasure. It, it, it is, and we always seem to have these interesting conversations. We don't always <coughs> agree with each other, but that's okay because that's uh, what keeps the friendship going. Uh, but we had a, an interesting conversation about immigration. Uh, we have different views on it. My wife uh, immigrated. Uh, came over. She, I went through immigration from Hong Kong, yours from the Philippines. So it's not a topic that uh, we're unfamiliar with, uh, but right. we've got different perspectives on it. So can you just share with us your thoughts about some of the things that are happening uh, in this immigration world, uh, particularly since uh, uh, our Attorney General just filed another, another uh, appeal or challenge today? Where do you start? <laughs> <laughs> from the uh, legal point of view, uh, you know, on Monday, President Trump signed the second immigration executive order, which, uh, according to him, uh, cleaned up, if you will, a lot of the objections that right. the Ninth Circuit pointed out to the last order. But it still uh, contains the uh, prohibition against people coming from six countries uh, that are basically Muslim countries. And they did eliminate Iraq because, in my opinion, the Trump administration finally figured out that American soldiers are fighting and dying yeah. alongside Iraqi soldiers over there to protect American interests, So, but be that as it may. Um, the state of Hawaii, through its our Attorney General Doug Chin, on Wednesday filed a second lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was an amended complaint to the original lawsuit that was filed. Um, and in essence, what Hawaii is saying, and they want a national order such as the Washington judge issued about a month ago. To cease it. Right. They want to cease it. They're saying that it does discriminate against uh, Muslims and uh, on the basis of religion and race and ethnicity. And under the U.S. Constitution, the, you know, we have what's called an equal amendment rights mm -hmm. so that all people are to be treated equal and without prejudice and discrimination and that type of thing. Um, on its face, the new executive order is fairly straightforward. I mean, they now uh, allow any green card holder, mm -hmm. you know, permanent resident aliens, <clears throat> to leave and come back into the country without... Regardless of the country. So those five or six that were named, if you've got a green card, you can still come and go. I think that is uh, to be determined, mm. quite frankly. I mean, if you're a... Uh, if you're from Yemen, for example, and you've got a green card and you leave the U.S. and want to go visit family and you want to come back into the U.S., I think you might have a problem Really, if you're a green card holder. Mm. But uh, other green card holders from around the world uh, should not have a problem anymore. Okay. The, um, the, the, the issue, as I see it, is the, the immigration legal status is one thing, but what and what the Trump administration says is another thing. You know, mm -hmm. they say, no, we're not discriminating. We're only enforcing the law. We're only going after criminals, which should be deported. And I don't think anybody disagrees with that. But in fact, if you look at what is being done, mm -hmm. the ICE agents, the Immigration Customs Enforcement agents, who are the Border Patrol cops, if you right. will, they're out arresting students mm -hmm. who have a, a legitimate, uh, what they call the DACA visa, you know, for the kids that were brought over here when they were younger and they have to stay, they're being, these children are being arrested, their parents are being deported. Mm. None of these people have criminal records. So the aggressive enforcement by the customs people 
uh, is really what's happening. And it's, it's kind of because, in my opinion, the tone and the whole impetus behind this immigration executive order of the Trump administration is to um, do what Trump said he was going to do during the campaign. You know, which is to basically get rid of all the people that we don't like. Right, well, build we, the wall and protect the borders. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And I guess part of what we discussed at lunch a little bit that I, I think we reached a common ground and agreement on mm -hmm. is that we've got adequate laws on the books already. There's already Aloha, a law this is in Kili place. Aquino with um, and it hasn't always been enforced as much as maybe mm -hmm. it could or should have been. And if we just take the perspective to enforce the current law, then we're going to get or make a big step in the right direction towards the protection of the borders. That's correct. The protection of the borders and also the protection of people's constitutional rights. Because even people who are in this country illegally, once they get past the border, you know, that specific border area, they have constitutional rights under our Constitution. Mm. Everybody who is facing deportation should have a hearing before an immigration judge. Now, the hearing might end up being five minutes, but at least they get a due process hearing. Mm. And, and then the judge makes a decision whether or not they should be deported. The problem is, from a practical point of view, that we don't have enough immigration judges. As you've probably read, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who have been waiting a year, up to right. two years, for a hearing. Right. The Trump administration recently put a federal hiring freeze on all government agencies. They exempted uh, Homeland Security, so now they can hire another two or 300 immigration judges. That should help. But you're absolutely right. The immigration laws are, are quite satisfactory, and they pass constitutional muster, if you will. It's the administration of them that is the real problem, because it's not being followed. Yeah, well, and that, that's sad that we've had the laws on the books that's been ignored, mm -hmm. and that's kind of got us to where we're at today, and now we've got to try to bring some sensible solutions, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. together. Um, and as far as, you know, everybody keeps talking about the illegals, you know, the illegals or the ones that's committed criminal acts. Mm -hmm. um, any special provisions for anybody that's illegally in this country or has committed uh, a crime of some sort that allows uh, a different set of rules or regulations? For many, many years, there has been an immigration law on, on the books and it's supposed to be enforced, that any person who's not a U.S. citizen, who is a green card holder or here on a tourist visa or student visa or HB1 visa, or whatever, if, if they're here and they're not a U.S. citizen, if they commit a crime, they are subject to deportation. I mean, I do criminal defense work, and, and you see people in um, district court, the smaller court here downtown, who get convicted of drunk driving, at, or if they want to plead guilty to a a drunk driving mm -hmm. offense, the judge will warn them, do you understand that because of your immigration status, green card mm -hmm. or your student visa or something like that, you are subject to deportation if you are convicted of this crime. And it obviously goes for felonies too. But So that's an example of the law being on the books and just not adequately enforced. Very interesting. Well. I'm not sure what the solution is other than enforcement of the laws that are already there and in a reasonable way. I mean, you said, you know, ICE has kind of been unleashed and maybe getting a little right. overly aggressive in maybe interpreting the law. Maybe they need to be pulled back a little bit and, and just focus on the law in its purest sense and enforcing it at that level. Right. We talked about this at lunch, but, you know, I would not use the word maybe overly aggressive. You know, in my opinion, <laughs> ICE has been unleashed. Yeah. I mean, they are just out of control. You know, they have a lot of authority, and they are arresting students mm -hmm. who have, uh, you know, the protection that 750,000 students were given by the Obama administration. They're going to school and so on. They're uh, arresting their parents and deporting them and that type of thing. We could go on and on. Of course. One, we talked about uh, the federal... Uh, staffing restriction that the Trump administration put in, and we might want to talk about the IRS. If well, I was just going to say, maybe we should shift over to a, a slightly less controversial topic, and we can talk about tax reform. Right. Uh, and and tr that was one of Trump's big selling points, was that he wanted to restructure the tax process, rewrite the code, 
um, and provide some cuts, you know, or reduce savings, reduce taxes. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's your thoughts about that? If, if from a tax defense lawyer, I always look at it from an enforcement point of view, and I think the fact that the IRS has been losing employees for mm -hmm. several years now uh, through retirement or people just up and quit. Mm -hmm. The problem is the, uh, the Internal Revenue Service is not replacing these employees. And of all of the, ins the agencies in the federal government, it's the Internal Revenue Service that brings revenue yep. into the government, much more revenue than anybody else. Anybody else in that yeah. it costs to run the IRS. Yeah. And to not be replacing these talented, experienced IRS employees uh, with new people and new training and the technology is as you well know I mean mm -hmm. you deal with it all the time yep. it's very outdated so th that is in my opinion a, a real failure of the Trump administration to this point you know the, the technology has helped a little bit and you're able to get information online more than you've ever been able to before mm -hmm. which has got its pluses and minuses when you factor in the cybersecurity issues and that sort of thing but you know they have made some advancements in the technology side um, what worries me, to, and to your point, is that there's an awful lot of institutional knowledge. That talent is leaving, mm -hmm. and it's not being replaced. And you can't replace 25 years of experience with somebody who's just started a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a lot of ways that the system works that you've got to be there to understand. Uh, and to get through the maze of trying to resolve some complicated tax issues, you need people with that experience. And mm -hmm. that's becoming difficult to find now. It is. And when you hire new people, what kind of people do you get? I mean, you get bright, young college graduates with zero experience, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, it's a tough environment. And I think with the, the cuts, too, uh, I think some of not only the enforcement, but also the audit side mm -hmm. uh, is going to be hurt a little bit. And, and a lot of people may applaud that. Uh, but I think, you know, what's happening is that the audit function is becoming more focused and more narrow on specific areas mm -hmm. where they will get the biggest mm -hmm. potential return, mm -hmm. which means large companies, uh, international tax issues, and maybe some of the mm -hmm. very high-end wealthy individuals are going to be getting looked at a lot more closely than anybody else, mm -hmm. which means that compliance may start to suffer. Mm -hmm. The statistics of the last year or two is, are that a uh, person earning less than two hundred thousand dollars a year, generally, or a family, you know, has a less than one percent chance of being audited. If you earn over two hundred thousand, just like you're talking about, or, or a larger business and so on, their audit chances go up to five to ten percent. Yeah. The other emphasis that the IRS and the Department of Justice are making right now is they're going after foreign undisclosed income. Mm -hmm. They're going after foreign bank accounts, foreign assets that individuals hold that, that do not report. As you know, as a return preparer on the tax return, there's a question, do you have a foreign bank you account or do you have foreign assets yeah. and you've got to check yes or no. Answer. Well, let me, uh, I think that's a topic I want to spend a couple minutes on, but I need to go on break right now. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker and Steve Pengree. We're talking a little bit about some of the controversial uh, current topics uh, in the news today. Uh, we'll be back in about 60 seconds. Okay, I'm here with Brett Obergaard of the Faculty of the School of Journalism in the Department of Communications at UH Manoa. We've had a number of shows. We have a movable feast going on, and we talk about journalism, we talk about language, we talk about communication in general, and we talk about the effect of that on the country and on individual people. Brett, it's so good to, to be able to discuss this with you in our movable feast. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is a great opportunity. You'll have to come back again and again, okay, deal? Uh, that's the deal. Brett Opergaard, <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel. We care about everything. Thanks. <laughs> Aloha. My name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association. And our show is all about educating board members and owners about their responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. You can watch me live on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker and today I'm interviewing Steve Pengree who's a, an attorney and focuses in the tax area among other areas. 
Uh, and we've, we've had some interesting conversations so far about immigration. We're just now getting into tax issues a little bit about some of the changes that may be happening. And we were just touching base a, a little bit, Steve, on the, the foreign bank accounts. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and my comment to you was that there's a, a, a large amount of people that just don't understand the implications. For example, um, if I had a mother or a brother or a sister or a father that I held maybe jointly or had check signing ability or access to that account mm -hmm. that was in Hong Kong or the Philippines or Australia, Germany, <laughs> Germany wherever, um, that's supposed to be disclosed. That's right. You know, and a lot of people don't appreciate that. Yeah. That's right. In the last, well, 10 years, but specifically in the last five years or so, the Department of Justice and the Internal Revenue Service has become extremely aggressive going after foreign bank accounts and unreported income. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's in the, according to some estimates, the trillions of dollars of unreported money uh, that U.S. taxpayers uh, have to, should and, be reporting. And that's the proverbial low-hanging fruit that the IRS is seeing, is that that's easy pickings. They can go in and, and find those assets in today's environment a little bit easier than they could before and then be able to tax it accordingly. That's absolutely correct. There's two ways that the IRS does this. Number one on the tax return, as we briefly discussed, uh, the, there are two questions. Do you have a foreign bank account and do you have foreign assets, meaning do you own a corporation or mm -hmm. something like that overseas? And you have to check the box, yes or no. If you check the box, yes, you have to fill out what's called an FBAR, a foreign bank account report every year. And by the way, FBARs used to be having, uh, you had to report the prior year in June the IRS just, and FinCEN, the Financial mm -hmm. Crimes Enforcement Network, they just changed that deadline now to move it back to October 15th, the last day where you file an extension, and it's an automatic extension. But the FBAR form has to be filled out, and people don't know that. A lot of tax preparers either don't know mm -hmm. it or they don't tell their clients about it. Well, and it's not that complicated a form to fill out, at least the ones that I've been involved in. And those were pretty straightforward bank right. account or, or brokerage account type mm -hmm. of. And, and essentially, and, and add to this, but it's basically name, address, account number, balance, that sort of information, right? That's correct. The, um, the other thing, that, uh, the other action that the federal government, the U.S. federal government has taken is they passed a, a law called the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, or FACTA. What this does is the American government went out to every bank in the world, mm. in the world, <laughs> and all of the bank branches, and said, you must report to the IRS the accounts of any U.S. citizens that are in your bank. Wow. And if you don't, you will be cut off from the using the U.S. financial system. That, which, that's a big hammer. That's a big <laughs> hammer. And so right now, there's about at least 200 banks that are reporting to the IRS. So if, and the, the problem is if, if, and we have a lot of people who are dual citizens here, mm -hmm. Philippines, Japan, China, Malaysia, Korea. Uh, if, if you try to open a bank account or even have a bank account in, in your home country, for example, they are now coming back to U.S. taxpayers and having them fill out this mm -hmm. FACTA information. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if you, if, if the IRS learns from the foreign bank that you have an account in that bank and then they do a cross check and they find out you haven't reported it through the FBAR you or you some, checked your tax return yep, no yep. when in fact it was yes, uh, it could be a big problem. You got some explaining to do, but yeah. wh what are the implications, Steve? I mean, what happens if they do find an account that was out there that had you know, hundred thousand dollars in it. What are the penalties and the fines involved? Are you familiar with that? Yeah, there's there's basically uh, what they call a kind of a negligent, you know, no intent mm -hmm. uh, violation, and that's like a ten thousand dollar fine. If they if the IRS finds out that it was an intentional mm -hmm. uh, non disclosure of this bank account, the fine can be up to fifty percent of the highest balance. Wow. In that account. Over a, over a five period. year period. Five years. Yeah. So in other they, words, if they had a big balance and but it came down, they'd have to pay fifty percent of that. Of that year, right? Wow. Every year. You know. Wow. So in you know a hundred thousand dollars, quite frankly, for a lot of offshore bank accounts is not a lot of money. Most people have a million or two or ten, mm -hmm. or something like that. So the, the fines are horrendous. They, They're they very draconian. Be. So it's always better. And and to disclose them, it's not that hard. And and I guess what the IRS is really looking for 
is foreign source income. They want to be able to see if there's any income that's being generated offshore that they should be getting a piece of. That's correct. What a lot of people don't understand, especially green card holders, I've said this 20 times, but I still hear it. They don't understand that if you hold a green card, you are subject to U.S. tax laws, mm -hmm. just like a U.S. citizen, which means you're taxed on your worldwide income oh. from any source. <laughs> I've had clients who have actually given up their green card because in their home country they own yep. a lot of resources and they just didn't want to be taxed, so they just took their green card and gave it back to the embassy. Wow. Now, have you heard anything in the conversation with some of the tax reform that's going on or supposed to be going on mm -hmm. that's going to relieve some of this or has this been kind of a quiet moot point? No, actually the, the emphasis on foreign bank accounts and all the reporting requirements that we've just been talking about is going to increase. Mm -hmm. And along with that is a whole area called anti-money laundering. You know, if you've walked into a bank, you've gotten a bank account, you, you have to fill out all these forms now. It can, now it's 10 pages of forms as opposed to five years ago, maybe two. Uh, and there's a thing called KYC, know your customer. And yep. the banks yep. are yep. under yep. a lot of scrutiny. And to do that. So in sum, it's the financial intrusion, or the oversight of your financial transactions by the U.S. government is going to increase and become worldwide. One of the, and this was... They didn't make a big deal out of it. One of the comments that I read somewhere, and it could have been the Wall Street Journal, is that there's been some talk about an amnesty period where the Trump administration is considering allowing people to bring those foreign bank cash balances back into the U.S. and waive the taxation of those balances. Have you heard anything about that? Uh, very generally, nothing specific. And I thought it applied to foreign businesses. I think it did, yes. Yeah, more, rather yeah. than to individuals. Yes. Uh, that they were trying to work out some program so that American businesses will bring their the cash profit back centers home. back home. Right, because there's a lot of companies, and you know, Microsoft and Apple, are, and I'm sure a lot of others, uh, have billions mm -hmm. offshore mm -hmm. that they're leaving offshore because if they brought it home, they'd be taxed pretty heavily on it. That's correct. Uh, and so they're leaving it off, and if we wanted to bring that money back for capital investment and for other, other purposes, then there could be a, a period of amnesty there where they're mm -hmm. allowed to bring it back in. Um, I can't help but think, you know, logically, intuitively, that to pump several billion dollars back into the economy would be a good thing. Even if it costs some taxes, but they're not getting the taxes anyways, right? Well, my understanding is for the corporations, what the Trump administration wants to do, instead of charging the the corporations, the 30 or 35 percent corporate tax, it would be brought down to something like 10 percent. Uh, so the amnesty so is not. It's not really an, a, a tax-free. Go to jail, yeah. free, you know, get out of jail free card kind of thing. It's well, it's still but 10%, still, 10 percent is yeah, better still, than 35. Yeah, right? it is, and it's still a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I know we've had some other conversations about the, the, the tax reform, reducing the rates and all that, but a lot of it is just discussion. Uh, coupled in with all of that is the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare and how that's going to change. And there's an awful lot that's going on. It's going to cost a lot of money. And then, you know, cutting taxes at the same time is, is potentially problematic. So we'll see how this all plays out. But uh, it is going to be an interesting year, I think. Uh, Switching gears, uh, you know, into a, a different topic that again is in the news quite often, um, homelessness. Oh boy! <laughs> yeah, there's uh, there seems to be a lot of homeless people. Uh, I hear about them. I actually see a number of them. Mm. Uh, I've seen them in Hawaii. Kai. I know you you live uh, closer to downtown, and, and you see a lot here. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your thoughts about the the homeless situation? I do live in Chinatown. And uh, it's, the homeless situation has increased tremendously. Uh, it, what I see coming out of the city and the state is, is all this talk about providing housing mm. for people. Well, they're really only talking about 150 houses or 250 houses, and, and, you know, and they're arguing about the funds and all that kind of stuff. In my opinion, it doesn't get to the heart of the problem, and that is... 30 to 40 at least percent of the people that are homeless are mentally ill. I mean, mm. truly unable to take care of themselves. 
you know, you, I see them every day walking around Chinatown or lying on the street or sitting there just mumbling to themselves. Yep. These people need help. And the city has been defunding or not funding the few nonprofit organizations in the city that provide that, that, provide that kind yeah. of help. Mm -hmm. And what the city has been focusing on is moving these people off the sidewalk because the tourists don't like to see them. You know, and the businesses don't want the homeless people capped out in front of them. But all they're doing is they're just moving pieces on a game board. Well, and Steve, opinion. I can't help but think that some of these people wouldn't want to go into these homes anyways. The only way to keep them in there and off the streets is to put a lock on the door and not let them out. <laughs> Part of that is due to a person's mental illness. Mm -hmm. you know, they need treatment. And the sirens in downtown area of Honolulu have increased in the last year or so. And why is that? Because the homeless people are being picked up by these ambulances and taken to Queens, for example, hospital, mm -hmm. through the emergency room. And the Queens emergency room is being overwhelmed with these people. And as one doctor was saying, you know, these people need some type of a clinic where they can go for a $59 visit instead of a $5,900 visit yeah. to the ER, you know. Yeah. And Driving health, co health care costs up across the board. I mean, that's one big component well, of it. Well, and also, if, if you think about it, denying health care to people who really, need, really it need it because exactly. they can't be seen. I think a mobile clinic, in my opinion, mm. if the emphasis were put on mobile clinics that could go out and have some professional people, you know, nurses and doctors and paramedics and things yep, like that, yep, yep. you know, it could be on the spot and could give pe give some treatment to some of you these know, people. And, would and help. we're in a closing seconds of the show. Oh, I'm sorry. And so, you know, my, my comment about this is that, you know, we've got this increasing need for health care and health care professionals, but at the same time, we're seeing those numbers drop. And we've got physician shortages and north sh uh, nurse shortages. You know, it just seems to be opposing. It seems that if we don't do something, it's just going to get increasingly worse. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, maybe our next show, we could talk a little bit about some of the solutions. <laughs> That's a thought. All right. Uh, this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. Uh, generally, we talk about uh, subjects of, of business nature, that uh, success stories of businesses in Hawaii and individuals. Uh, but occasionally we also talk about current topics uh, that has some impact in the business community and, and today all of our topics of course did. Uh, we hope to see you next week, next Thursday, 2 o'clock. Until then, aloha. <laughs>